Okay, so the book of James. Who's read through the book of James here? Okay, all right, all right, good. If, if you're a good Christian, no, I should say. <laughs> no, but the book of James is one of those books that, uh, you know, I, I taught through the book of Romans several years ago, and I remember reading a thing that said, you know, uh, a, a Christian's Bible, when you kind of just set it on the binding, it should automatically flop open to the book of Romans because you've been there so much. Well, I think the next place it should flop open to would be the book of James because James is a really, really, really good book, and we're going to be going through it. Probably won't take as much time. There are only five chapters there. Um, but as you kind of check out the book of James and, and, and just get an idea what it's all about, uh, they always, it always falls along the same kind of lines. As you see people teach through it, you hear people teach through it, uh, it always kind of comes down to a few of the same things. It talks about faith that works, you know. People say, okay, James is, is about faith at work or working. Uh, faith in action is another way of describing the book of James. Because it's very practical, very practical things that every Christian needs to know. Our faith is not a, a, a mental thing. Our faith is not, oh yes, I understand the gospel. Oh yes, I understand how all that works. No, it's something that, that is such a part of us that we go out and it, it's at work in our lives. It's something that's actually working in our lives. And so you'll see that a lot as you, as you look at James. Here's one that I really like, the book of James, 18 ways to ruin everything. <laughs> 18 ways to ruin everything. You know, there's, there are principles in the book of James that, man, if, if you're not practicing these things, uh, there's going to be something going on in your life that's not pleasing to the Lord. There's so many nuggets in the book of James and so many powerful foundational teachings in the book of James that we need to understand as Christians. And I think it's a great time for us to go through the book of James because we just finished Hebrews, which was talking about very immature believers in the Lord that were backsliding, and now and the writer was trying to bring them back to a place of uh, stability and stableness in the Lord. And so the book of James is written to those mature believers and, and encouraging them to stay on the right path. Because if you don't practice these things as a Christian, you're going to ruin everything is kind of the idea of somebody's graphic here. But anyway, the graphic that I ended up going with is, is here, the, the pillars. And ah, the Lord just gave me this in, uh, I was falling asleep after I'd been really studying and preparing for this book. And I was just right on the edge of sleep there, and the Lord just gave me this word, pillars. This idea, these such foundational principles that we find in the book of James. They are the pillars of our faith. Now, he doesn't go into great detail to talk about uh, Jesus and him being the Messiah, him being the Son of God, him being uh, crucified, resurrected. All those things are a given, that the believer should already know those things. But he's going on from there and saying, these are the pillars that uphold those ideas and those concepts that you should already know as a believer. And so, pillars. Um, one of the reasons I think that you can see this idea of faith in action is this verse here, uh, a little bit later we'll find this in chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if, somebody, if someone says he works, can faith save him? If a, destitute, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? And then he goes on there and he says, thus also faith by itself, if it, is, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And so a very foundational principle right there that kind of permeates throughout the whole book. It is a book that talks about our faith in action, our faith actually working. It's fine to say, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he died. I believe that he resurrected from the grave. I believe all those things that the Gospels tell us about. But 
as this passage indicates here, if you say to someone who's in need and, and you're always just talking about it but never doing anything about it, is your faith really working? Do you really have a true faith or do you just have some kind of mental assent to faith? And so foundational principles here that we're going to look at along those lines. Today we're going to look at faith and patience. Those are the two principles we'll look at here today. But again, why do we call or why would we look at this book as being a book of, of foundational principles or pillars? Well, first of all, James was the younger brother of Jesus, the James that we're talking about, the James that wrote this epistle. He was the younger brother of Christ, half-brother, of course, um, had a different father, but uh, he was that younger brother. And, and so he saw Jesus. He saw Jesus live out his life, and he saw the miracles. He saw those things, but he was not a believer, as all of the disciples weren't true believers until Jesus rose from the dead. But at that time, that's when he was converted to faith. And so um, he had a, a greater understanding than, of Jesus than, than many. But we find this here in Galatians 1.18. After three years, this is Paul speaking. After Paul had kind of been converted, he went out and the Lord dealt with him for three years. Uh, he, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and re, uh, remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And so we know that James wrote this because he's the only one that has standing, the only James in the Bible that we know of that has the kind of standing to write uh, such an epistle, to have that kind of authority. And of course, James would also go on to pastor the first church there in Jerusalem. Now, another reason that we can look at James being a pillar of the church is because Paul actually called James a pillar. And that's, a, that's another reason I, I thought of that. Uh, and here in Galatians 2.9, when James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me uh, and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and the and they to the circumcised. And so there was a time in the early church there where Paul uh, had been sent out by the Lord to go out and speak to the Gentiles and to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, whereas the others there were going to stay in Jerusalem and speak to the Jews, the circumcised. And, uh, and so that's what they had kind of agreed on. But there again, you see James being seen as, as one of the key people in the early church along with Peter, but Peter would later go on and, and move away. John would also go on, and then we find that, that James becomes the first pastor, and he writes the first epistle. And I think that's another really great reason to look at this book in that context. The first letter that was ever sent out was sent out by James, the first pastor of the, the first church of Jerusalem, and he writes a letter to the churches all around the area, the ancient world there. And his letter is the one that we're going to be studying here. The very first time somebody sat down and said, man, what do the churches out there need to know? What do they need to understand about our faith? Uh, and, and so it's pretty amazing. They think the book was written around 45 AD, sometime around there, which is not very many years after Jesus was actually crucified and rose from the dead. It could have been a little bit later, but very soon. And you ask the question, well, still, that's, you know, over a decade. You know, what's the deal? Why weren't more letters written? Because the early Christians, they, they had no time to write letters. They were thinking, man, the Lord's coming back any day now. He could come back today. We need to get out there and tell people about it. And it wasn't until 10, 15, 20 years later, people started saying, well, you know, we need to write this stuff down before we pass away. As the people that actually saw those events take place, we need to start writing these things down just in case the Lord does tarry. We want everybody to know what, what kind of things went on here in the life and ministry of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, all those things. And so James was the first one to do that. He saw the need for people to be grounded in their faith for mature believers to, to go forward and have these very critical uh, understandings about what our faith means. 
and what it means to work out our faith and act out our faith. Hey, our faith is not a, a nebulous kind of concept. It's something you need to actually uh, live out in your life. And so James was the first to do that. And so uh, there's some foundational principles right there, just this idea that it's the first time these things were written down. James was called James the Just, and he was also called the Bishop of Jerusalem by many ancient writers. And so there's this idea that people understood he was the first uh, pastor, the first bishop there of the first church. Here's what uh, Philip Schaff says. He wrote a, a massive, massive volume of uh, books on the history of the church. Really good. First time I had ever pulled it off the shelf, but I uh, found some good stuff in there about James. But anyway, he says, after the departure of Peter from Jerusalem, James presided over the mother church of Christendom until his death. And uh, many people believe that his death was probably 63 to 69 A.D. time frame right before the temple was destroyed. So a critical time where James is, uh, you know, ministering to the Jews and he still had a heart for them. It wasn't like, okay, we're Christians now and you Jews are lost and we don't want to talk to you anymore. It was very much until the first century had, had ended, the, the Jewish Christians there were very much Jews. They were still going to the synagogues. They still had Jewish friends, whoever would have them. And, uh, and they were trying to convince their Jewish brethren that, hey, Jesus is our Messiah. He fulfilled all the law. Look, and they would go down and show them in the Torah how Jesus had fulfilled all of the prophecies about the Messiah. And they were still very much engaged in that Jewish community there. But at a time very close to the end of the nation of Israel in 70 AD when that temple was destroyed and the city was sacked and Rome came in and just wiped them out, killed uh, millions, hundreds of thousands anyway. At around that time, James was preaching that gospel. He was preaching the word to the people there. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they had just had it and they took him up to the pinnacle of the temple, that same place that Satan said, it took Jesus to. And the pinnacle is, is not a high point. It's, it's more of a, a place where the wall comes together in a corner that overlooked the Kidron Valley, about a hundred foot drop off there. And they took James to the pinnacle of that temple and they pushed him out a hundred foot down and he didn't die. <laughs> he got up to his knees and he started praying. He started praying for the people of, of, the, of the place there, the Jews. And they came down that wall and they beat him and they stoned him to death. He was around 94 years old at that time, but to his very last breath, he was trying to communicate the gospel of his older brother to the Jewish people. And so he was a very, very respected man, very well loved. And, uh, you know, his writings, some call his writings the Proverbs of the New Testament because it talks a lot about wisdom and just very practical day-to-day -day knowledge that we need to understand. And so they viewed him as being a very wise man and the things that he would say. And so he wrote all these things down, uh, but the people loved him there. Of course, the Sadducees and the Pharisees didn't like him because he was preaching Christ. Um, but when he died, they believed in Jerusalem that the reason that that God allowed the city to be sacked was because James was murdered. And you see that here. Uh, Eusebius, uh, a Jewish or a Christian historian, he wrote, uh, so admirable a man indeed was James and so celebrated among all for his justice that even the wiser part of the Jews were of opinion that his murder was the cause of the immediate siege of Jerusalem which happened for no other reason than the crime against him. And so, of course, that wasn't the case. Uh, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman government because God allowed it to be destroyed, because they had sinned, because Jesus had prophesied it, and, and many other reasons, because they had rejected their Messiah. That's why they were destroyed. But during that 40-year time frame, it was James who was leading the charge there in Jerusalem to try to get them to understand but they killed him for it. And and so the people, it was they were so outraged by it that the high priest at the time who had ordered James to be killed 
was himself removed from office because there was such an uproar. Why would you kill such a just man? Why would you kill such a good man? And there was such an uproar about it that that high priest was removed from office. And again, the townspeople and the, and the people in the area just thought, man, we, we were destroyed because we allowed James to be killed. And so that gives you an idea, a little bit of background about him. But the writings that we find here in the book of James, uh, many people believe they're a commentary on the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus himself gave. And you can look through there and, and we'll talk about it a little as we go through, but I mean 20, 25, 30 even uh, parallels of what Jesus said in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount James brings those things out as well. And so you can really see the teaching of Jesus coming right through uh, the teaching of James. And we'll, we'll look at a couple of those things as we go through. But those are kind of some of the, the ideas that I want to throw out there for why this is such a foundational book. Um, but we'll go ahead and start to actually go through it now. I uh, just want to give you a little bit of a background. Oh, before we do that, here are some parallels. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of those. But you see, Jesus spoke about inheriting the kingdom, the crown of life, hearing and doing, uh, praying and receiving, and, and all those things. Those were things that Jesus talked about, and also you see James talking about them in his epistle. And that's just 10 of them. Like I said, there are probably 25 to 30 of them that you can actually uh, find in there. So let's go ahead and read James chapter 1, verse 1 through 8, if you follow along with me in your Bible. It says there, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet uh, trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways." Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your servant, James. We thank you for this opportunity to read these foundational pillars that you have spoken to him and through him, and now they come to us. And Father, we ask that you would help us to understand these things in a way that we never have before, that you would use it to ground us and, and secure us in our faith in a deeper way. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I know all you guys that went out and bought a New King James Bible are now mad at me because I just mistakenly read from the ESV version of the Bible. <laughs> like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> As I'm reading through there. Okay, there we go. New King James. All right. So patience and conviction are, are some of the things that we see here in this passage. Patience and conviction. Um, as, again, as, as you look at this, um, this idea of patience, James says, look, you're going through trials. I know it's difficult out there. He's talking to uh, the 12 tribes of Israel that have been spread out all over that ancient world. And all of them, because of their faith in Jesus Christ, are going through trials. They're going through tribulations. They are being harassed, as, as we talked about so much in the book of Hebrews. The ancient world was no place to be a Christian. Let me tell you, it was not an easy deal to be a Christian. It was a hard thing. Uh, people didn't celebrate your Christianity. And uh, much like then, our, our nation is becoming that way now. And, you know, it's going to become more and more difficult to be a Christian in this nation. And so another thing that I think is, is good for us to go through this book, another reason for us to go through this book, the trials that we are going to face. How do we face them? How do we face them? Do we face them with anger? Do we meet the anger of the, of the world with our own uh, anger in return? When we're reviled, do we revile in return? Uh, how do we do it? How do we make it through and still retain the name Christian? 
and make an impact and and people are able to see wow those Christians are really different or those Christians at least are different that I see over there at Calvary Chapel North um, and so looking at that going again back to verse 1 it says James a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to those 12 tribes which are scattered abroad he says greetings but then he says my brother count it all joy Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or endurance, the idea of endurance or patience. And then you, you see the Greek word for patience there, hupomone, uh, which is a very famous uh, Greek word, but it talks about steadfastness, constancy, endurance, enduring the hard time that you're going through. Um, in the New Testament, characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. You're not pushed away from your faith. You're pushed closer to your faith as the trials and the tribulations increase in your life. And it may become more and more difficult. What happens to you when you go through trials? What happens in your life? Does it make you want to read your Bible more? Does it make you want to study the Word and, and really get grounded in the truth? Does it make you want to pray more? Or does it make you kind of, does it derail you? I know when you're not a strong believer, it's very easy to get derailed. Something happens in your life, oh, that's it, you know, God doesn't love me. This Christianity thing ain't working for me. And, you know, they talk about how great it is, but I just don't see it. You know, those kind of things. But we need to understand that those trials, those things, they should be working in us to produce patience, produce some kind of steadfastness, some kind of endurance, if we allow it to do that. Uh, this is Charles Spurgeon. He says, endure everything, suffer everything that God sends you. Bathe yourself in this rough sea till by God's blessing it hath strengthened you and cleansed you. For to that end he sends it, and that it may perfect you by discipline, educating all your spiritual faculties and bringing out all your power for his glory. And so Spurgeon just kind of says, hey, just bathe in it. If you're going through a hard time, look at it as God is, is going to do an awesome work here. He's going to do an awesome thing. Yes, I'm going through a trial, but James says, count it all joy. It's a joy to be persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ. It's a blessing. Uh, and we don't see it that way. But we need to see it that way. As a believer, we need to refocus our minds and understand it in the way that James saw it. Because certainly James, he was in a tough, tough spot. Here he is, the pastor of the first church ever, in a place that they hate Christians. They want to kill him. Um, and they want to stamp out Christianity. It's not just, well, we'll just tolerate those Christians over there. We don't agree with them. They wanted to stamp it out. The Jewish leaders wanted to stamp it out completely. And every time they found somebody that was worshiping uh, Christ or, you know, just talking about the resurrection or any of those kind of things, man, they, they killed them. They stoned them to death. They didn't tolerate it at all. They wanted it to stop. But the more and more they persecuted those Christians, the more they grew. And their, their persecution really added to the church. It didn't take away from it. And so as we look at patience here, the first thing that you see there, I mean, talk about a heritage, right? Oh, yeah, Jesus, he's my brother. He's the son of God, you know. Yeah, he's my older brother. Don't mess with me. <laughs> what kind of older brother would that be? You know, I mean, come on, that's the best older brother you could have. No offense, Gary. But <laughs> my older brother's Jesus, the Son of God, you know. But you see his humility here. He didn't use that as a calling card. You know, a lot of people like to drop names and stuff. And uh, I listen to a lot of teaching on the Internet, and, and pastors are always dropping names. Oh, yeah, so-and-so, he's a good friend of mine. You know, somebody real, real famous, you know, he's a good friend of mine. Oh, yeah, we went to lunch together the other day. That kind of stuff. Dropping names. But James, here he is, the younger brother of the Son of God, the Messiah. 
the Savior of the entire world, he says nothing about that. He says, I'm a servant. I'm a slave. And that's what that Greek word means, doulos. A slave, a bondman, a servant. Either indentured servant or a voluntary servant. Either way, it's a servant in, in a house. You're serving. And so James says, you know, I'm nothing, essentially. James doesn't try to make that his claim to fame. He just says, I'm a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a servant. I'm a slave. And I'll do whatever he tells me to do. He came to that place in his life, a place that each one of us need to also come to. And so going on from there, though, he, he says who he's writing to here, the 12 tribes that are scattered all over the place. And as the years go on, they'll be scattered even more as the nation of Israel will cease to exist as a nation and those, those tribes will be scattered even further. And there's a lot of talk, you know, about, well, the lost tribes of Israel. No one knows where the tribe of Dan is anymore or uh, any of those other tribes, you know, the tribe of Judah. You know, they're just kind of uh, disseminated into other nations and, and nobody knows where they are. But God knows where they are. God knows where they are, and he's going to bring them back. He's bringing them back now because it's a part of prophecy for the nation of Israel to become a nation again and for those tribes to be regathered into the nation of Israel. The book of Revelation talks about 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe will be anointed. They'll be sealed for service in the time of the tribulation. And so God knows who they are, and God is able to bring them back. But here's the other thing. DNA also is now making breakthroughs that we thought would never happen in that regard. Um, DNA provides the information and the markers to say, well, yeah, this person is descendant from this tribe, you know, 600, 1,000 years ago, and they can take those things back quite a ways. And so I have no doubt that eventually... You know, they've already kind of mapped the whole human genome and, and they kind of can tell you exactly where all people groups come from in a general sense. But I think they're going to fine tune it to a point where they'll be able to establish if you're from the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Manasseh and those kind of things. But we do know that there is, at this time, uh, Jews that are found in China that didn't even know they were Jews. Uh, and then when they were told that you're part of the Jewish faith, you're part of that ancient uh, people group, they have this sense, and people have said in China and other, other places, they said, you know, we had, a, we had a feeling that we were always a part of something like that. We had a, a, an understanding that that's kind of what, but we had just lost it over all these years. And they have begun to go back to Israel. I mean, they look every bit Chinese, but they have... Jewish blood running through their veins. It's quite an amazing thing. And they're all coming back. Now I want you to turn over to Isaiah chapter 11 for just a second here. In verse 11, and this is one of those prophetic passages that talks about this idea of the Jews returning to their homeland. It says there in Isaiah 11:11, 11, 11, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt and Pathros and Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, and these are all ancient nations, but that's basically Iran right there, Elam, from Hamath and the islands of the sea, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. And it goes on and on. But there you see this idea that God's plan is to bring back his people to the nation of Israel. Right now, it's, it's a nation over there that's struggling to exist. You know, ever since they reestablished themselves in 1948 and, and took a little bit more land in 1967, the Arabs and the Muslims over there have been trying to 
scrape them off into the ocean. They've been trying to kill them ever since. And that's what we see going on now. And, uh, you know, it really just shows you that God has his hand on these people. He has his hand. His prophetic word is coming to pass right before our eyes. The fact that they are there is an absolute miracle. And the fact that they've been able to maintain a nation there for all these years is, is an even greater miracle probably. You know, it's just amazing. But that's God's plan. He's going to bring them back into their land and bless them. All right. Well, another thing that we can look at here, joyfully reconsider your situation. Count it all joy or consider it joy. Account what's going on in your life, not as a bummer, not as, man, this is just not good, and why is God doing this to me, and, and moaning and groaning about it. No, he says, count it as a joy. The things that are going on are joyful at this very moment in my life. Why are they joyful? Because I'm happy, because I'm really just overjoyed at, at my present situation? No, because God has his hand on my life. I know he loves me. And I know all things are working together for the good, and uh, that's okay. And so I can have a joy about that. That doesn't mean that I'm happy and, and just really uh, ecstatic about, you know, whatever's going on in my life. But it does mean that I have a peace in my heart. I have a peace in my heart, a cheerfulness in my heart, because I know that God's going to get me through this. I know that God's going to bring me through. He's going to bless my life because I'm one of His. And so count it as a joy when you meet those various trials. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Uh, there's a guy who, don't know his name, but he was in the third century. And right before he passed away, he wrote a letter to a friend of his. And this is what his letter said. And I thought this was very interesting. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure uh, of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. And then he goes on to say, these people are the Christians and I am one of them. And so an absolutely unknown person, right before he dies, he writes a letter to a friend of his stating these things. This world is terrible. It's unbearable. It's really, a, really a bad place. But I've discovered, along with many others, there's a secret. Though I may be persecuted, though my outward situation is not a good one, I have a peace. I have a peace. I don't care about those things that are going on. Why? Because you've come to a place of being able to master your own soul, is what he says here. And I, I think that's a great understanding, the mature believer in Christ who comes to this place of being firmly grounded in their faith, firmly grounded in the fact of who God is, not who I am, not who my, how my situation looks at the moment, but who God is. And I can have a joy about that. I can have a joy about that. And so these people are the Christians. I'm one of them. And I've come to that place as well. Have you come to that place in your life? Well, if you haven't, I, I encourage you just to really dig into the things that James is talking about here. Because he's going to talk about here in a minute, you know, just asking God for wisdom about the situation I'm in. Asking God to help me and, and those kind of things. But then we waffle. We ask God for something, and then we, oh, well, I'll see if what he says is what I want to hear. And then if it isn't, well, I'll look for wisdom somewhere else. No, he says, you ask God for something, ask in faith, believing with the conviction in your heart that he is able to do what you've asked him to do, and that he's going to give it to you. That's the key. But this idea that testing produces perfection in your life. Trials, they produce something. They should be producing something in your life. And it's not just a bummer to go through. It's something that's going to be uh, good in the end. Now let's look at that verse over there in First Peter. First Peter 1 Peter 1.6. 
Oops, sorry. Peter tells us there, and again, Peter's coming from the same perspective of what James is coming through. Peter was there in those trials in Jerusalem, and then he went to Rome, and he's suffering the same kind of things. And his exhortation in First Peter is on the, along the same lines. Hey, you're struggling. I know things are tough, but hang in there. Hang in there and have some patience and, and some resolve in this time because he says in verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, I'm back in ESV for some reason, I don't know why, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And so Peter says the exact same thing. He says, in this time... In this struggle that you're going through, it should be producing in you patience. And that patience should be producing other things in you. It should be producing hope and character as Romans. Paul himself also says, chapter 5, verse 3, we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance or patience or endurance. Same, same idea there. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. It should be producing in you. If you're not growing stronger in your trials, you're not going stronger in your tribulations and the things that you're going through, it's because you're not dealing with it in the right way. And it's a lesson that the Lord needs you to learn. And so you might come back around one more time. How many people have gone through trials in their life, they didn't learn their lesson, now they're coming back around again? Some older mature Christians in there, you know what I'm talking about. You will see that trial again. If you don't learn the lesson the first time you go through and learn how to grow from it, God has to take you back through again. Why? Because he's picking on you? Watch this. You know? No. Because he loves you and he wants you to learn and he wants you to become strong and he wants you to grow through that so that you can go to somebody, a young, immature believer in Christ, and say, brother, you're doing it wrong. Here, let me show you. Let me show you what happened in my life. Let me, let me tell you how God worked in my situation. And you're able now to encourage that young believer. You're able to show them. You have a testimony now that it has worked in your life. And now you have something that you can share with someone else. But it only produces if you allow it to. It only produces if you allow the process to, to take its place. But what do we do as Christians? Something starts coming down in our life. Something's going on. Some kind of trial. Some kind of tribulation starts happening. God, take this thing away from me now. You know, and we start telling God what to do and naming it and claiming it. And and uh, you know, we go to our our groups of people that we pray with and we start telling them all the things that are going on in our life. And man, you just got to make this stop. God, it hurts, and I don't like it. And you know, but. What we should be praying is, God, let your will be done, right? Let your will be done in my life. I don't know why I'm going through this, God, but you show me. You show me what you're trying to teach me. I believe your word says to count it all joy and that this stuff that I'm going through, this trial that I'm going through is supposed to be producing in me some resolve, some perseverance, some patience. So, God, you do your work and give me the ability to make it through. There's that old thing that people say, you know, hey, be careful what you ask for. Don't ask God for patience. Oh, don't do it because <laughs> he'll send you through a trial. And, and in a way, that's kind of true as far as what we're reading here. Uh, if we want patience, if we want endurance, if we want those things, you can't just go out and buy it, right? You can't just, okay, God, just give it to me. No, you have to learn it. It's how we work as human beings. We have to learn those things. God has to take us through and teach us those things. But he wants to do it. 
And if we allow Him to do it, He'll do that work in our lives. He says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. That's a good place to be, isn't it? Wow, God's done a perfect work in my life. And we looked at that in Hebrews. Maturity. Completeness. Perfection. It, it's, it's, it's maturity for the believer in Christ. Complete. Lacking nothing. There's nothing I need because I've allowed God to do the work He wanted to do in my life. And it's produced something in me that I'm now able to share with somebody else. I'm now able to go and to build up another believer in their faith as they go through the trials. I remember hearing a story from a guy that I really respect, A.E. Wildersmith. He's a a creationist that has passed on, but uh, I think he had five earned doctorates from universities all over the place in Europe. and Very intelligent man. But he relayed a story once about how during World War II, during the Blitzkrieg and all the things he's from England, uh, I believe or he's working in England at the time or something. But anyway, um, you know, when London was being bombed and it just looked like England was going to lose its nation, he went to, he was he was just distraught over the whole thing and he was just really having a hard time with it. And he went to an older brother in Christ and he, he began to whine and complain about, oh man, I just can't believe what the Germans are doing and our city's being destroyed and da 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 and the old man just kind of was smiling at him, you know, and and uh, and after a while he just stopped and he said, why are you smiling at me? What, what's, what are you doing here? You know, he didn't know why he had that reaction. And the older Christian just said, you know, I'm so happy. I'm so happy for you. And he said, what? I'm just telling you all this stuff that's going on in my life and you're, what, why are you saying that? He goes, Gus, I just, I'm so happy to see that God is still working in people's lives, perfecting them and bringing them through trials to teach them patience and to teach them the things that they need to learn to become a more <laughs> mature believer. <laughs> what do you going to say that when you say something and, and you get that response from, from somebody like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. I'm glad too. So um, <laughs> what's he going to do now, I guess, <laughs> is the question. But we need it. We need it. Okay, so moving on to the next point here. As we look at uh, patience, now this idea of conviction. Now he says there in the King James Bible, and I think most of the versions say in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally, and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. But let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so I've replaced the word faith with conviction because the Greek word there indeed is that same idea. Now, the word faith, he says, ask in faith. Okay, well, what does that mean exactly? What's this uh, a different word for faith than we normally use? It's conviction. It's you know, I am convicted that this is true. I have a persuasion, a credence, a moral conviction of this religious truth or spiritual truth that I I believe in or uh, something that somebody has told me. I am convicted about it. And so I'm going to ask in conviction or with a conviction that it's going to happen. Uh, I won't ask in a, in a way that is uh, wavering or doubting is the idea. And so uh, another pillar of our faith is just believing in God to the degree, not that he exists, yes, we believe that, but is he going to do it? If I ask him for faith, is he going to give me faith? If I ask him for wisdom, if he, is he going to give me wisdom? If I ask for other things that he has told me in his word that he wants to give me liberally, is he going to do it? Is he able to do it? If I ask him and he gives me the answer, am I going to take that answer? Or do I not believe in him enough to believe that he cares for me enough to give me the right wisdom and give me the right answer? Those are the kind of things that that he's dealing with here. And uh, this is another parallel of what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. We'll look at that here in a second. But again, it's this idea of moral conviction, religious truth, 
especially a reliance upon Christ for salvation, assurance of belief or to believe, of faith or fidelity to something. And, and so that's the idea. It's a conviction. I really seriously believe this. Vine's Expository says, this is not, when he's talking about this doubting, ask, ask in faith, ask with conviction, not doubting. He's saying this is not the equivalent to unbelief, but expressing a hesitation, or the hesitation which balances between faith and unbelief and inclines towards the latter. It's not saying if you ask God for wisdom and, and then you start wavering, you're now in a place of unbelief. It's just you're doubting. It's, it's teetering on that line somewhere. Either way, it doesn't give glory to God. And the Bible says very clearly here that don't let that man think he's going to get anything from the Lord. If you're going to ask in that way, if you're going to ask not really believing God can do it, it's a sign of a lack of faith. But it's, again, the same thing that Jesus taught. Look here in Matthew 21, 21. Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, and then he goes on to talk about some things, then he finishes it up there. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. That's the way to pray. We, we talked about prayer last week. You don't ask, and then kind of in the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, God's never going to do this for me, though. You know, you ask believing that you're going to receive it. You're fully expecting that what you've asked God for, he's going to deliver on that promise. Okay, so who doesn't lack wisdom? <laughs> kind of a uh, almost a silly question, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, yeah, I don't lack wisdom at all. I've got the wisdom thing down, no problem. We all lack wisdom, don't we? Uh, no hands are going up. Any hands? Um, anybody lack wisdom here? Who doesn't lack wisdom? But again, this is this is talking about in a spiritual sense, I think, uh, for the most part, uh, because it's it's really uh, you know I talked about this being the Proverbs of the New Testament. Proverbs is all about wisdom, isn't it? And that's kind of what James is referring back to, is this idea of wisdom. In uh, well, here's a quote for you first. Experience comes from what we have done. Wisdom comes from what we have done badly. <laughs> I kind of like that. I just threw that in there for you. I don't know what it means in light of our study, but it's true what we've done badly. But again, going back to the Proverbs, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now, doesn't that sound a lot like what James has just said to us? If you, if you need wisdom, ask God, but ask him in faith with no doubting. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, turn to him. Because if you don't, he says you're going to be like a wave tossed back and forth, to and fro, unstable in all your ways. And so this is the idea. It's not just spiritual stuff. It's in all of our ways. In all of our ways, we are to acknowledge him, to ask him for wisdom. But ask it, not doubting, but ask it with a conviction that he's going to answer and he's going to do it. And so we ask expecting and willing to receive. I expect God to answer me. I expect him to give me the answer I need to hear. And when he gives me that answer, I'm going to be willing to put it into action in my life. Before I got out of the Navy, I've told this story a few times, but I was that double-minded man, unstable in all my ways, because I was trying to figure out in my own uh, wisdom, God, do you want me to get out of the Navy now? Do you want me to retire now, go into the ministry? What do you want me to do? And, and you know, I was thinking, no, I should stay longer. No, I should get out. And back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so I came across this passage when I was out at sea on my last deployment on an aircraft carrier, out in the middle of the ocean, read that passage, and it went, poof, I mean, like a ton of bricks. Here I've been asking God for wisdom, but I've been taking what he's been giving me. I know that's what he wants me to do, and I've been thinking, well, I don't know if I want to do that or not. I don't know if I'm ready to retire just yet and go into the ministry. But God was very clear to me. That's what I want you to do. But I didn't want to hear that answer. 
I didn't want to hear that. My wife didn't want to hear that answer. You ask her. She was happy being in the Navy as a chief's wife, living on base in the nice base housing. She didn't want to get out of the Navy at that point. But God was very clearly telling me, I just didn't want to hear it. And so he really convicted me with this passage right here. You ask in faith. You expect to get an answer from him. And when he gives you that answer, you do it. Don't doubt with a conviction that this came from the Lord. You, you put it into action right away. And God will bless you. I've seen it in my own life many, many times. And so uh, 1 Timothy 2 talks about the same idea here. Paul telling Timothy, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Pray, but don't doubt as you pray those prayers. Another quote for you here. I'm not going to try to pronounce his name there, but a, a German um, statesman said, give me the benefit of your convictions if you have any, but keep your doubts to yourself. I have enough of my own. <laughs> Anybody say amen to that? We do doubt, don't we? It's hard not to. You know, as we get thrown around in life, we're just thinking about stuff. and oh, Should I do that? Oh, I don't know. You know, and, and some of that's wisdom that we, you know, weigh, put it on the scales and weigh it and kind of decide. But, you know, when it comes to the things of the Lord and, and praying to Him, we really just need to trust in Him, acknowledge Him in all of our ways, and He will give, you the, give us the wisdom that we need. All right, well, look at what happens to the person who does not do that. The person who asks doubting. The person who is double-minded, the person who doesn't have that conviction in their heart that, that God is going to answer in the way that they've asked him. Look at their life, driven, tossed, unstable in all areas of life. And that's, uh, you know, that's a real truth there. When we become that person that doesn't trust in the Lord and acknowledge him in all of our ways, we become unstable, driven by every wind of doctrine, tossed around. And what he also says here is very powerful, is that we shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. Albert Barnes says here, He that comes to God with unsettled convictions and hopes is liable to be driven about by every new feeling that may spring up in the mind. At one moment, hope and faith impel him to come to God. Then the mind is at once filled with uncertainty and doubt. And the soul is agitated and restless as the ocean. That's what happens when we don't fully place our trust in the Lord. We don't pray with him, pray to him with the conviction that he's going to answer our prayers. We should expect to receive nothing from God if that's how we're going to ask him. And so, wow, what, what a a pillar to place in your life. If this is you today, think about, you know, some of the things that have happened in your life. Do you feel like you're tossed around? Do you have a clear uh, understanding of what God has for you in your life? Or are you kind of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth? You know, once you're able to make that commitment to the Lord and, and understand what he wants you to do and go for it and do it, it's awesome. Because you have a sense that I know I'm doing what God's supposed to told me to do. And I'm not going to doubt about it. Yeah, it might be hard. And those thoughts start coming into your head. Well, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Uh, you know, no, don't allow those thoughts to come into your head. Cast them down is what Second Corinthians tells us to do. I remember hearing about, I know I'm going to go over time here, sorry. Uh, a one-armed handball champion. Did you ever hear about this guy? His arm got taken off in some kind of accident, and but he began playing handball, you know, the racquetball without a racket, and uh, and he became a champion in handball. And one of the reporters at the championship asked him, "Now, how is this possible that you only have one arm, and and here you are, you you're the champion?" And he said, "Well, it's very simple." He said, "The other players, I have an advantage over them." Because when that ball comes off the wall, they have to think, should I hit it with my left hand or should I hit it with my right hand? And that little bit of hesitation 
causes them to miss the ball sometimes. I have no options. I've got that one arm. I've got to hit it with that one arm. There's no other option. And that's what it's like when you, when you really are in tune with what God has for you in your life. You're not thinking about the other options. What else I should be doing with my life over here? No, there's just the one option. I'm going to do what the Lord told me to do. I've got a conviction that he has told me to do this, and I'm going to do it with all that I have within me. I'm going to go for it. You start doubting. You start seeing the waves and, and, and seeing the wind and the, and the boat rocking and stuff, and you start playing into that and receiving that stuff into your life and allowing it to uh, cause doubt in your life. Watch out. You're going to sink just like Peter did. All right, last thing here. The other thing is the person who does fully commit, God gives to them liberally. He gives them that wisdom. He gives them that direction, that guidance that you need liberally. He pours it out on you because he says, Ah, my child loves me, believes in me, trusts me fully commits themselves to me, I'm going to bless them. That's how God works. But to the one who says, I don't know if I believe in God to that degree, don't expect anything. All right, well, we're just going to close with that here today. I encourage you guys to read ahead in the book of James. Read the whole book and read it through a couple of times. It's a blessing, and uh, we'll just close with that. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Lord, that you have written these things to us as we are scattered abroad. And Father, we receive them with faith. We receive them acknowledging that they come from you. Acknowledging that, Father, we can trust in them and that we will put them into action in our lives. Father, we pray that you would just bless the congregation as we embark upon a new book, a new story in your history, a new uh, chapter in the, the pillars of our faith. And Father, we thank you for these things. We praise you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.